It gives me great pleasure to introduce Geraldine Moriba uh, to the stage, but let me tell you a thing or two about her first. Uh, you probably already know her, but um, she's an executive producer of CNN's In America Unit, and such is responsible for leading the editorial direction of the division and working closely with CNN anchor and special correspondent Soledad O'Brien. She is a Toronto girl. She's bo she, uh, she started her work here at the CB in Toronto at the CBC, uh, but before joining CNN, she also worked at NBC News and ABC Primetime Live. She also um, studied, she studied political science and women's studies at the University of Western Ont uh, Ontario. And I, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Geraldine Moriba to the stage. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you? Good. Good, good. I was, I was going to say welcome home because this is really your home. But what is home for you? I mean, you've been, how long have you been away from Toronto now? Um, 20 years. 20 years. So yeah. what's it like to come, come back? Well, I come back all the time. I come back to visit my family, some of my family's here in the audience. Um, and, but this is the first time in 20 years that I'm coming back for professional reasons. All right. Now, um, you, I mean, l l let's just, just start from the beginning. Let's start with your sort of the, the, that moment where, you, you, where you, you sort of got the urge to become a journalist or when you discovered journalism. Can you take us back to that moment? Were, were there any, any people or any, any programs or, or publications that turned you on to journalism in a way? So this is the story that a professor doesn't want to hear <laughs> because um, I call myself the accidental journalist. Okay. I did not um, aspire to be a journalist. I um, had very different aspirations and goals. Uh, I call myself an as uh, accidental journalist because I got my very first job at the CBC as a way of saying to my mom, see, I applied for a job. And then I got it. And, and that's how, like, uh, quite honestly, my career began. Yeah. It was at a, a time when, um, the ROM had an exhibit called Into the Heart of Darkness, and it was quite an offensive, racist exhibit. Mm -hmm. And I was part of um, an organization, a coalition of young people and organizations, and we were organizing against the exhibit and trying to have it dismantled and mm -hmm. shut down, which it was ultimately. But in that process, I wrote a press release and sent it to many news outlets, including the CBC, and um, I was in somebody's office and I sent off a fax that said, here are all the reasons this exhibit is faulty. Here are all the reasons you should be doing a story on it. Mm -hmm. And do you remember fax machines? I don't know how many of you know what that is. <laughs> um, I sent off a fax a few minutes later, a fax came back, that sound. And I went and I picked it up and it said, with the person who wrote this fax, please apply for the following job. And there was a job description. And I went home that night, and my mom said, so did you apply for a job today? And I said, yeah, I'm going to apply for this one. And <laughs> quite honestly... It? What was it? Do you remember? It was an internship. It was a three-month internship. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had um, plans to go to Nigeria mm -hmm. as part of the Crossroads program. Um, so I was supposed to be taking a year off. It was a gap year before I started grad school. Mm -hmm. And I was going to go to Nigeria. And I had my passport. I knew where I was going to be living, what I was doing. And um, I got a job. And in that three-month period, I realized I like this. Oh, yes. And the Gulf War broke. And I started covering that story. And at the end of three months, I decided this was just too good and too important mm -hmm. and too special to walk away from. And they offered me a job, and I stayed. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my career. But you studied political science at the University of Western uh, Ontario. I mean, how helpful was that? Or how, how, how sort of central was that to, to the journalist that you became in general? Well, that's the irony. I was, everything I did um, worked perfectly as a, a found, laid my, I created a foundation for this occupation unwittingly. I, it wasn't planned, mm -hmm. but political science was absolutely the right major for me, um, right. especially at the beginning of my career. All right. So uh, j just, just since you mentioned the beginning of your career, so the beginning was at the CBC, and at, and at some point you, you worked on As It Happens. Um, tell me a little bit about that, ex about that experience, because you, you weren't 
there for very long before you moved. In fact, you're probably there for about a just two years. Two years before you moved to uh, to the states. And so, uh, tell me about that early working at the CBC and the reason why you you thought just after two years, you wanted to. You know, go to the big so again, he's looking for something profound. <laughs> the truth is, I fell in love. I fell in love with a wonderful See, this man. This is not rehearsed, people. This is not rehearsed. <laughs> and, and I moved to the United States because I got married. Oh, okay. um, I never intended to change my career at that point, though. Right. And when I went to the U.S., um, I started working in broadcast instead of radio mm -hmm. because at that point, and still today, um, radio in the United States is much more talk radio, mm -hmm. and it's not where I wanted to go with my career. So I transitioned platforms and went from radio to broadcast. Yes. But 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 those first breaks, those first like to get that foot in the door. Um, I mean, maybe there's something that uh, particularly the CNC would like to hear about those early, you know, what it takes to yeah. break into because you 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 started at NBC. A ABC. ABC and then I mean uh, just to get a foot in the sure, door in ABC sure. is no, is no is no minor no. achievement. Well. Working at CBC in Toronto was no minor achievement. Mm -hmm. Finishing the in internship and getting um, a job offer mm -hmm. was uh, tremendous. And at that time, and, and I'm not, I don't know what the diversity numbers are in the newsroom at CBC today, but at that time there were very few people who looked at me, looked like me. Right. Um, there were so few people that when I walked down the hall and I would see somebody who was brown, whether they were Asian, black, Latin, whatever they were, mm -hmm. I wanted to know who they were because right. I felt so isolated. Mm -hmm. um, but after going, you know, and, and, and it's about um, hard work. As soon as I arrived, um, you know, I was very diligent and got assignments, and one assignment would lead to another and so on. When I went to the United so States. So freelance, you started freelance? At or? CBC? No, I was uh, staff. So, sorry, okay. When I went to the United States, um, I thought, given the prestige of a show like As It Happens, mm. I would be my calling card. So I went to the US with a few names of Canadians who now worked in New York City and in the media and had formerly worked at the CBC. Mm. And they were each kind enough to meet with me and they, they all said, good luck, <laughs> like, you're not gonna get a job. Right. And I said, thank you very much. Mm. And um, within a couple of months I realized that Everybody south of the border, um, people south of the border really don't pay attention to Canada. Not only did they not know w anything at all about As It Happens, they didn't know what the CBC was. Um, and I was starting from zero. Right. So I treated it like an assignment. When you get an assignment and you have to break a story, do re develop a story, figure it out, you do research. So I, at that point, there was, now I'm really aging myself. There wasn't the internet. Um, <laughs> um, Remember those days? I know the audience over There really 40. wasn't. <laughs> so I watched the credits at the end of the shows, and I wrote down every name that I saw. I'd record the shows and write every name, okay. and then I wrote a letter to every person on every show, wow. one by one, and some of those letters led to um, conversations. Mm. Every conversation at the end of it, I thanked them very much and I said, can you give me two names of two more people you think I should speak to? And they would tell me the names of two more people. And I would take those names and I'd write them letters and I'd make cold calls and then I'd say at the end of those conversations, can you give me two more names? So, you know, two people become four people. Four mm. people become eight people. Mm. Within about two weeks, I had three job offers once I started doing that. It was... Right much easier than I thought it would be. And what was the first one? What was the, what was they the were both, um, they were all actually at ABC News. Mm -hmm. The first job offer was as um, a page on nightly, no, World News mm -hmm. Tonight with Peter Jennings. Mm -hmm. And um, the lady who offered me the job said, don't take it. And I said, why not? And she said, you're way overqualified, don't take it. And I said, I want a job. Mm -hmm. and she said, don't take it, you're gonna hate it, don't take it. And, and I said, but I, I'm taking it. And she said, no, I'm offering it you, to you because I have to. Please do me a favor. Don't take it. So, well, I what, didn't. What, what were her reasons for that? She she thought I would come in and be miserable. Mm -hmm. But what she did was give my name to a, a more senior person um, who offered me a job, a different type of job at World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, mm -hmm. and um, I took it. The next day, I was offered a job um, at Primetime Live, right. and I called back World News Tonight and I said, "I'm so sorry." I have daily news experience, but I don't have magazine news experience, and I'd like to grow. 
Right. And, um, and they were great, and I'm st I was part of the same ABC News family, mm -hmm. and it was fine, and, right. and that's where I started in the United States. Right. And that's also where you started with long form, with some kind of long form narrative, right. long form, right. uh, I mean, which, you know, we will get to, um, uh, particularly your work in the In America series um, in a second. But um, for you, particularly for our students, I, I w I'm interested in that transition from daily news to the long form, if you can talk to us a little bit about um, how you wrap your head around changing, uh, thinking about stories in, in, in a sort of in a more prolonged and taking the longer view of stories, um, and how you compare that to the, to the you know, relatively pre pr brief period where you worked in breaking news and daily news. Well, to even um, step back just a little further, I will say that I really strongly believe that um, my success as a documentary filmmaker is largely due to starting out in radio. Radio is listening to a story with your eyes closed, which means everything you hear has to mean something. Every sound that's conveyed means something. Um, TV makes you lazy because it's, it's, it, you watch with your eyes and your ears and it's, it's not quite, um, the nuances aren't as uh, subtle as they are with radio and um, and print is completely different too because in print you can put so much information in. You can put charts and facts and pictures and, and you can't do that with radio or TV. Um, for me, moving into broadcast, the best thing that ever happened was beginning with radio because it taught me how to be a storyteller, mm -hmm. how to write a narrative, um, how to create a story with a beginning, a middle, an end, create a climax, what's a good story? And having all of that and moving to broadcast made a big difference. Mm -hmm. um, to do it with the economy as well, because of time right. and, and resources. Yeah. Right, and, and then um, once I, I got started in broadcast, it was really learning how to identify, um, when I was given an assignment, mm -hmm. what was the story, who are the characters, how to tell it, mm -hmm. um, and pitching and, and learning that if you want to get stories on that you think should be told, mm -hmm. you have to pitch and pitch and pitch, but you have to know how to pitch. Right. Um, and, and there's an art to that as, as well. Well, I mean, maybe what we should, I mean, now that we're sort of going into the sort of the meat and potato of your work, which is a long form documentary, maybe we can start, Melanie, with the first, um, with the, with the first clip, uh, I think it's The Almighty Debt, and then we'll watch a, a two minute clip and then we'll talk more. So many questions here, and I, um, uh, because we we have we're going to show four clips, so I'm going to try to spread them out a little bit. So let me let me start with with this documentary in particular, um, I which I've which I've seen in full. Um, how does an idea like this begin, and how do you develop? Um, you mentioned something about choosing characters and and choosing how to tell a story. How did you, for example, choose this particular church? And there was another, which we didn't see in the clip, the actor, the, the students who want to study acting um, as well as part. Uh, tell me a little bit about, tell me about, just in general terms about this particular documentary. Um, this particular documentary started out very differently. Um, the idea that I had was to look at civil rights and, and the role that the church played in the civil rights movement. Um, in the 60s and where are they now and what's happened and what role is the church playing today in the black community and, and are they as active and engaged and we hear numbers all the time about how um, um, religious and faithful the black community is but what is the church really doing so originally that was the premise of the documentary um, as we began to develop and there's a development stage with every documentary where you start off with one idea and, and it evolves. And generally what happens as stories evolve, they change. And in this case, um, this pastor, um, Soares, Buster Soares, was so um, uniquely situated in his community to make a very real change that it felt like the right story. He um, has a congregation of 7,000 people, over 7,000 people, and it was at the beginning of the recession, and he was consciously trying to reverse a pattern that he saw in the community, which is that 
um, people at the lowest part of the socioeconomic um, ladder were willing to spend more money on their next set of Nikes, next pair of Nikes, than they were to um, put that same money than they would in their savings account. And, and what he did was at his own church start a grassroots organization where every member had to sign a contract and and at that said they would take classes on learning um, how to manage their finances on, and on investing and so on. And he wanted to lift his members. And this also happened because there were so many people turning to him and his church for support. They were trying to get um, bailouts out of their um, mortgages that were defaulting. They were losing their jobs. Their children were dropping out of college. Quite honestly, one of the characters this happens to in the documentary because the parents and didn't have money for tuition and they didn't qualify or couldn't get grants. So there were now adult, young, young adults who had dropped out of college for lack of money and so on. So he saw this as the new real crisis in the community and was doing something. So that was rich enough to tell a story, but the challenge with a documentary is it's not two minutes long, it's a total of 44 minutes when you include all the commercial breaks, um, or when you don't include, rather, the commercial breaks. So there has to be enough um, content that can hold the interest of your audience because it's not a movie. When you go to a movie, you s make a commitment to sit from the beginning to the end, and there are no breaks. When you watch TV, because there are built-in breaks, people will flip. So you've got to, at the end of every section, every mod, make sure your audience returns. And this story had enough. Yeah. The young man that you're mentioning, there were three families that we focus on. One is an actor who um, had everything going against him, an aspiring actor, rather. He wanted to go to college. He had no money. He was in a single-parent home. Um, he didn't know his father. He, his parents, his mom was evicted while we were shooting the story. Um, he had a lot going against him, but what he had was a dream and aspirations and a church that said, we will help you. If you do all of these things, we will help you, and they did. Mm -hmm. um, another story in, in the documentary was about a couple um, who, they were on the verge of losing their home, and this was a middle-class couple. Mm -hmm. uh, they had, you know, I think two or three Mercedes Benzes in their garage. They were wealthy. Like they had all the trappings of wealth, of, of success. But when you looked at their accounts, they were drowning in debt. Um, and then there was a third couple. Um, and the husband was a very, and they were, by the way, that middle class couple never lost their job. They just didn't know how to balance a checkbook properly. Right. The third couple was uh, a, a family that had um, adult children who were in university who one by one were dropping out mm -hmm. because their parents couldn't pay their tuition anymore. And in that third um, household, the dad was a um, senior management person at a company and, and he, he was close to retirement. He was in his mid to late 50s and they let him go and the company um, because it was going under, got rid of their pensions. So he was suddenly unemployed, wasn't yet qualified for a pension, his pension was in jeopardy, and his wife's income wasn't enough to sustain their household, and he was trying to get a job. And after the documentary aired, he did get a job, and it was driving, I think, like a bread delivery truck. That was all he could get. And these are real stories of real people. But, but uh, what is the work involved in finding those stories? And in, in a way, the question I probably want to ask you, do you audition people before you actually decide to invest in following them? Because you followed them for a long time, and you tell the stories quite in depth. Um, I almost want to find out about the selection process, and how do you tell that these three will, will, will tell us the themes of this documentary best, or will illustri illustrate the themes best? I wouldn't call it an audition process, yeah. because that... Um, implies that... I'm using it loosely. Yeah. No, no, I know. Um, but, but it is an audition. Um, we cast a very wide net. We look at as many possible stories as possible. And then there's criteria. Um, how telegenic is the person you're speaking to? I mean, can they articulate their ideas? If every time you ask them a question, they give you a monosyllabic answer, yeah. Well, that's not good TV. It's not interesting storytelling. Um, so you have to find characters who can 
articulate what's going on in their lives and have some degree of an analysis, but also that they're willing to give you access to their lives. Um, and without access, then it's it's not impossible, but it's a different set of challenges. They have to be willing to open up to you and share, you know, and share their life. Uh, and is, is that, do you find that there's some in some cases that's a problem? People, you know, people are not willing to to expose their lives or they, to to tell their lives on television. I mean, some private. Issues. Yeah, absolutely. When again, I mentioned that the story started out differently. There was a point when. I thought that maybe the story we should be doing we went from civil rights, and then it went to um, the LGBTQ community in the black church, mm -hmm. what was going on with that community. And we found this wonderful, courageous young man who um, was a father of two young children, um, had left his wife, had come out, and had decided he was, he'd come out privately to his, his immediate family. But beyond that, people didn't know, and he was gonna tell his pastor. And, and the idea for the documentary was to follow him and what happens after he came out. And, and that was our documentary, and we followed him up until the day he went to speak to the pastor. And we got to the church, and he looked at us and said, we can't come. Like he said, I, I, I'm doing this, but I don't want you in my life after today. I, I can't do this. And and that was the end of that story. And we'd been following him at that point for months. Right. Um, and listening. there was not much you can do. Right. Um, and we tried, because it's such an important story to tell as well. And that was the end of that. We had to cut our co our losses, losses and so, so that, that, move that, on. That thread did not make it into it, it the final It did not at all. all. Okay. We cut that down as a very short story mm. and, and used it in other ways, in other um, but okay. not as a documentary. Okay. So um, I think uh, to just continue, we, we we're going to watch the uh, the second clip, which is also from the In America series, the the uh, Promised Land. So Melanie, if you don't mind. In, in, with this clip, I just want to sort of move into a set of questions around um, telling African American stories and telling stories of the black community or, or marginalized or, or um, you know general communities outside of the mainstream. Um, and how imp first of all, how important is that to you, for you personally? And what is the buy-in from CNN in terms of telling these stories uh, and, and generally, and, and w whether you do you find that. There's some resistance from the media still about telling the stories, for example. And I have a couple other questions, but maybe with some of these. Those are good questions. Um, in America, the series is 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 broad. We there it's about identity stories. So it's it's more than um, black stories. We tell stories about Latinos, about Asians, about there's a story about coal miners. Um, returning veterans, we and you'll see there's a story about um, um, Haitians as they connect to Americans who are adopting them, um, and 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 so on. So it's an identity series, but it's about identity stories that are lesser told. Like we don't hear as frequently marginalized stories. Um, in Toronto, I, I um, every time I come home, I. I actually start reading the Canadian press again, and <laughs> just to get caught up so I know what's going on and I can engage in, <laughs> engage in conversation. Right. And, um, and, and it's, it's fascinating to me to come back and look at what kind of stories are being told about the, it currently right now being told about the black community. And the only story I see on the news right now is about a shooting mm -hmm. um, in three separate incidents involving 15-year-old yes. boys. Um, and that's horrible, but there are a lot of black people in the city of Toronto, and don't tell me those are the only stories that are newsworthy right now in the city. Um, it's disappointing uh, to come back in Black History Month at, or any time of the year and see that's, that's how our stories get told. And I'm not at all marginalizing their deaths. And I'm not saying that they're not newsworthy, those incidences, instances, but um, there's so much more in this community and other communities and, and stories that are rich and valuable and, and accomplishments that are worth celebrating that are not being celebrated. In the case of this particular story, um, I need 
to I am I feel obligated to break through stereotypes and to break through um, barriers and and I just feel for me personally that is my responsibility being the an an executive producer um, at any news work network is an awesome responsibility and, and I take it very seriously um, I would not be comfortable telling the kind of um, news stories that I mentioned um, on a, a daily or you know infrequent basis if there wasn't more to it. Last night we had a panel discussion here and I suggested that one way to tell these stories if we were going to dive into these three shootings is to actually dive into them. I don't wanna just hear it as a stat. I wanna know what's going on. Um, What's the story behind their lives? Were they tracked in school? Did they drop out and why? Because I understand that they did. Mm. Um, what opportunities did they have? Was there any intervention at any point? What's the community doing and so on? And, and I'm not hearing those stories. They're two dimensional and they're stereotypical and they re reinforce negativity. Um, this documentary, I created when I saw that um, two things happened. One was I was conscious of the fact that less than 1% of all VC funding, funding, venture capitalist funding, that is money that's given to business startups, went to minorities. That's a lot of money that's given out every year, billions of dollars, less than 1%. Now half, the, more than half the population of America is of color. Less than 1% of all VC funding goes to people of color. That is a shocking statistic, and a very, very important statistic. But um, unfortunately, I, have to, uh, I mean, uh, I wish we could show more of it because it, it I mean, it goes in into more d about their their frustrations, particularly, and their their the sort of disappointment with 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 the culture of Silicon Valley in general. But um, I, I wanted sort of just for our journalism students, particularly. Um, who are just starting about the, the risks and the rewards of being associated with certain stories or with certain communities or or t or do you, I mean do you because for for example someone like myself when I started as a journalist I did a lot of writing about the Arab community for example but I was always afraid of being marginalized of being seeing the, the journalist who just writes about Arab community but cannot write about anything else and that's why chose to write about theater, which is, there are no Arab people working in theater whatsoever. Um, not so, yet. Not yet. <laughs> um, so, so uh, uh, you, you, I mean, you, you're at a much more senior, you're at a very senior level of your career now, so you can, you know, you, you have that freedom. But for people starting out in the business, if they come from this community, what are the risks and rewards of telling the stories of their communities? Um, that's, again, another good question. Right now, we have to be at the table. We can't, um, you know what you know. And, um, and what we know as individuals has its limitation. And if everybody sitting at the table um, lives in the same community, grew up under the same circumstances, um, have very similar histories in terms of their education, it, there's a lim it creates a limit, limited world view. And in spite of how um, progressive or worldly we think we are, we have limits. And if your newsroom isn't diverse, and if the people sitting there making decisions are not diverse, and it's not just diversity in terms of race and ethnicity and, and gender or sexual, sexual orientation, it's diversity in terms of thought. Because you can have a room that is incredibly diverse and incredibly backwards um, in, in terms of what they're trying to do with their programming. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about thought. And, and right now, uh, consequently, as a result of the uh, economy in the US, newsrooms are shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, newspapers are dying. Um, as newspapers and magazines go away, as that industry shrinks, as television news shrinks, because it is, um, there are fewer, fewer, fewer and fewer jobs. So in a newsroom, when there are four people who are let go, and two are white, one is Latino, one is black, that seems you know, numerically okay, all kinds of people were let go. But when those two people who were let go were the only diverse voices in that newsroom, that's a problem, then you have none. Um, 
So it's important to have diversity of thought and of representation behind the scenes mm -hmm. as much as it is in, in your story selection because then the story selection ends up automatically becoming a reflection of who's thinking about these stories, who who's diving into them, and the kind of conversations that those um, thought leaders within the newsroom are having outside of the newsroom. And, and, and just, I'm gonna stay on the diversity for just one more question. And uh, for example, if you're at the CBC or, 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 or broadcast in general here in Canada, they're, they're, I mean, they're federally mandated and they have to fill in, I mean, to even on, on, on a very simplistic level, like, you know, quotas. But when you work in, in, in the private sector or when you work in, in, in privately owned media, how do you make a case for diversity stronger? How do you convince people, the, 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 the decision makers, that that makes good business sense? And that's, a good, that's, the, that's my question, a business sense. It's all about metrics. So I have some control. I don't have a lot of control. The In America series it exists because people watch. So... You know, I, I'm not working for public access television, I'm working for a corporation. And as long as they're making profit, and that means people are turning in to watch the shows and they're getting sponsorship, then the shows continue. Um, so not only am I telling news stories, but I have to tell news stories that people want to watch. And for a long time, there was a perception that when you tell stories about marginalized people, nobody will watch. Um, I have to demonstrate that that's not the case, as we've done with our In America documentaries. Um, this last documentary, not only did it do very well in, in the ratings, um, but it, on, on Twitter, it, it trended globally um, during the original broadcast. It had hundreds of reviews. I mean, it created an entire buzz. And I think that there's just a hunger to, to see these kinds of stories that are unexpected and original, and they're entertaining too. It's okay, by the way, to be a journalist and have fun and, and tell a story in a way that's a little lighter um, and still dive into a very serious story. Um, so I, I wonder if, if you can play the, um, an, uh, the clip from New Orleans Rising and talk a little bit more about that as well. So generally, I mean, in case you, everyone hasn't noticed, now there's a re another recurrent theme here, which is Soledad O'Brien. You work, you've, you work very closely with her now over a number of documentaries. And I want, just, I want you to talk a little bit about the relationship between you as a producer and, and Soledad as the anchor and as sort of in many ways the face of the series. And uh, I'd be interested to, to see what, what the input that she has in it and the relationship between you in terms, I mean, do you, I mean including, the, you know, the fights and the arguments that you have together, and, and that sort of, that's a very close relationship over a number of years. Yeah, in, in um, the production process, it, it's, it's an entire team. There's a, an executive producer who ultimately the buck stops with the executive producer. You have your reporter, they're the face of the story, and so in many ways they are held most accountable for what goes on the air, because they're not writing letters to the EP, they're writing letters to Soledad. Um, additionally, you've got producers and associate producers and assistants and researchers and cameramen and so on. There are teams where it's um, led by one person, either the executive producer or the reporter anchor. Um, I'm from a school of thought that everybody has something to contribute. And, um, and it's a very collect collective, collaborative process in, in, my, new, in my shop. Um, and everybody contributes to the, to the production. And, and what I will say about this particular documentary is we, we put this together um, on the eve of the fifth anniversary of um, Katrina. And from the clip, it looks like it's a documentary about Katrina. It's actually a documentary about Pontchartrain Park, 
which is a um, an upper middle class community in uh, New Orleans that started as a result of the GI Bill. And the GI Bill was a, 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 an initiative by the federal government in the US after the Second World War. When soldiers returned, they were given um, the opportunity to continue their educations to go back to school tuition free. They were also given um, a lump sum of money with restrictions to buy their first homes. And there was a group of um, soldiers who returned from the Second World War um, and, and, and subsequent wars who settled down in this community in New Orleans called Pontchartrain Park. And that began New Orleans' first black middle class community. Um, when you watch the news of Katrina, you see very, very, very poor people who lost everything. But there were also some very, very successful communities that lost everything. And in this case, we did Pontchartrain Park because not only did this community lose everything, but it seemed as though the city of New Orleans was sy systematically eliminating black communities. They were putting on these maps green dots over areas that they thought should not be reconstructed, areas that they thought were too blighted to save. And, um, and coincidence or not, um, they all happened to be over various black communities. And it wasn't just poor communities. It was areas like Pontchartrain Park. And this is a community that had doctors and lawyers and scientists, the mayors, three mayors of New Orleans grew up in this community. The head of the EPA grew up in this community. There, there were um, astronauts who came from this community. It's a very vibrant community and the city had decided to put a green dot over the whole thing and restrict any reconstruction. So the documentary ultimately is about the citizens of Pontchartrain Park trying to save their community. And, and, and so what effect did a community like this have on, 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 that, uh, sort of on that community, on, on, on the plans to not, not, not to reconstruct it all? I wish I could say to you that today it is back 100% and it's vibrant and it's not. Um, one of the um, people in the documentary, Wendell Pierce, mm -hmm. who's an actor, the actor on the series The Wire, I don't know if anybody saw that, or Treme, uh, Wendell Pierce is from Pontchartrain Park as well. So are a bunch of other well-known actors. And he led the drive to try and get the city, A, to get rid of that green dot, which they did, mm -hmm. um, but to get funding for the city. And um, last week, uh, coincidentally, um, one of their biggest funders, uh, the Salvation Army, withdrew their funds. And to date, they've only, I think, constructed about, reconstructed 10 homes. There are f a few more homes that have be been reconstructed, uh, reconstructed out of um, private donations and, and personal checkbooks. Um, but the majority of the community has not been rebuilt and, and their biggest funder has now pulled out their funds. Right. Now, uh, sort of in relation to this clip and the clip we're gonna see next, um, I, I was wondering, I mean, a, a number of the stories, even though you find hope in the stories and you find ways of telling the story that there's also a lot of sadness and, I mean, destruction and loss. And in the next clip, we're going to see particularly um, the set in Haiti after the earthquake. Um, I, I'm just sort of curious to know about um, how do you keep a kind of emotional distance from, from your subjects and how do you not get involved in their lives? How do you want them to campaign for that community to be rebuilt or for, um, for you know, the actor who can, you know, but... Uh, but you can't find funding to go to college. How could you not, how do you as a producer, how your team doesn't get too closely, because you work with them over a long period of time, you get to know them, you get to know their dreams, their hopes, their frustrations, and yet then you really, there has to be a certain critical distance from them as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's a, a book, a wonderful book, um, and I can s send you the title so you can share with your students. I believe it's called something like um, Sex and Drugs in the Bronx or something like that. And it's written by a, a New York Times, um, does anybody know which book it is? No. It's written by a New York Times reporter and she basically moved in with a family in the South Bronx over a period of a couple of years. She had her day job and every night she'd go back and stay with this family and she documented how um, the, um, 
crack epidemic was help affecting this one family. And when you read this book, it is so clear that she became engaged in their lives um, and, and, and crossed that line. And it, then it becomes a different kind of journalism. I, I think that you have to make choices from the onset and you have to be transparent. Um, the type of journalism I do, um, we still strive to be neutral. After all, I work for CNN. Um, it's important to maintain your objectivity. When you lose your objectivity, you also um, lose the opportunity to sometimes tell nuances that might otherwise be overlooked because no one shared it with you. Um, it is hard, it's hard not to get emotionally wrapped up, but you have to constantly remind yourself and remind the people in your stories that I'm, I, I'm paid to be here. I, I'm your friend, I respect you. Sometimes you're not their friend. Um, and sometimes you actually really don't like the people you're telling stories of, and that happens. Um, but I, I know personally, I'm constantly reminding them, I'm here with CNN. Like I, you say that, I wear a baseball cap that says CNN, like there's no mistaken. I'm with CNN and I'm paid to be here. Like you have to constantly find ways to remind them because there's something special about getting that much attention when you're in a crisis, when someone is saying, tell me your story, what's making you upset? What are you gonna do next? It's like having a personal therapist following you everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. And you do have to be responsible and s remind the people in your stories that this is going to be on national TV, probably international, and um, if there's anything you're uncomfortable sharing, don't share it because once I record it, I have the right to use it. So unfortunately, we, we, we're running a little bit out. So maybe um, we're out of time. So maybe maybe the final clip um, from Rescued, and then we'll open up to the uh, floor for questions. <coughs> we had time to show. This is a successful movie. Um, I guess one of the questions about this clip is is working internationally, so working outside. I mean, we've, we've the the previous three clips we've seen have been very much U.S. based, and now this takes you out of Haiti and takes you into and your unit outside of the country. So maybe we can talk about yeah. the challenges of that. And well, the documentary series that these are all a part of are called In America. So this is not clearly not in America. Um, and, and, and we are, CNN is, is a combination of seven different companies. I work for CNN Domestic. There's also CNN International. Um, we were able to do this documentary and, and m still have it make sense as an in, Amer in America documentary because we focused on Americans, um, this family. Um, and, and what's particularly interesting about this family is the reason why I felt compelled to do the story, and this was what we call a crash, where you turn a story over in, in days or hours. We produced this documentary in about three weeks. Um, the reason why we did this one in particular is because at that point, right immediately after the Haitian earthquake, there were all these stories of um, Americans going and taking groups of, of Haitian children and bringing them back and adoptions that were at different stages. And it was all about taking Haitian children out of Haiti and bringing them back to the noble American homeland. And, and I am being facetious. Um, um, I have some issues about that storytelling and, and, and that it's not the whole picture because in reality there are a lot of orphans um, and orphanages in Haiti th where their, their mission isn't necessarily to have all of the children adopted. And, in, and this is one of them where it's an American family, um, you saw the mom and the, the dad, and, and they are keeping the children in Haiti and trying to help them and they have a school associated with the orphanage, but they strongly believe that you don't have to take people out of the community, you have to help the community and keep their children there so that they can turn around and help their own country. Um, and so they, their philosophy is part of the problem is you take the, 
the future of the country away, educate them, and then they never come back. And then the it's a brain drain, and the cycle of poverty continues. Um, and and that what that's what made the story rich. And we just got very lucky because um, there was a, a young adult, a, a young man who was about 18, 19, maybe 20 years old, who had been in Haiti before the earthquake happened and was staying at this particular orphanage and was documenting, um, like doing a Christian story and, and happened to have this footage of Cindy June before we arrived. And it was that footage and seeing that footage that made us realize we found a story. Um, so I'm, I'd like to open it to uh, our audience, our, our students, um, and if you could just identify yourself and and there's somebody here with the mic who can um, uh, we'll just hand over the mic. Uh, so, oh. Can you identify yourself first? Yeah, I'm Simon, a student at U of T. Um, one thing I'm interested in is being a Canadian in a work environment in the States. What could you speak to the pros or cons or, or the... Um, um, I would think it would offer you a unique perspective. I'm thinking of Paul Haggis, too, the Canadian director who writes about, or who, you know, his films deal with similar issues. And um, I'm just wondering if it, if you catch yourself sometimes thinking that uh, coming from Toronto, uh, does it offer you kind of a unique perspective on things? So this is when I get to say all my Canadian jokes? Sure. Yeah. Like, how do you identify a Canadian? You step on their foot and they'll apologize? Um, I love being Canadian in America. I embrace it. I love wearing my Blue Jays shirt. And when the Raptors beat the Knicks, oh my God, that feels so good. Like it's just, it's, I'm proud to be Canadian. I'm, I'm proud of my Caribbean heritage as well. And, 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 and it's been an advantage, I think, because you know, people at face value think that what I'm bringing to the table is is a difference um, of thought based on my ethnicity. It's also a difference of thought based on my heritage. And I absolutely have a different, different news sensibility than um, the American news sensibility. And it, there's been a learning curve, but there's still some things that I just can't do. Um, um, there, the laws in Canada, for instance, with regard to um, cameras in the courtroom are very different than they are in America. Um, the laws with regard to what kind of documents you can have access to um, when a, a, a case is in court is, is very different than it is in America. Um, so there are very clear you know, clear differences between the two countries as a journalist. On the other hand, um, I think that there are freedoms that I have as a journalist in America to report on ongoing stories and investigations that I wouldn't have if I was here. So it's, I'm lucky, I kind of, I'm working down there and I have a Canadian sensibility and I can take it and leave it when I want to and um, I'm trying to make the best of two worlds. Other questions? Um, hello. Uh, so student activism um, and activism in young people is definitely a burgeoning topic in the Canadian media, especially with uh, the Quebec student strikes. Um, so what would you say is the hardest part and the, the best part about covering young activists and their communities? So coming from the perspective of somebody who was a student activist. Um, it's a story. I mean, covering the activism itself, you mean? Um, I, I would say that um, student activists today have an advantage that we didn't have when I was a student. And, and by the way, it's such a bizarre label. It's not like when I was organizing um, um, against an ex exhibit that I thought was racist. I thought of myself as a student activist. I just thought something needs to be done about this. Or Philip Rushton was at Western, and, and, and I helped organize against that. Or um, South Africa, um, a diverse, uh, uh, 
a divestment campaign against South Africa. I don't think at any point when I was involved in any of those initiatives, I was thinking, this is what you do as a student activist. It was more, I'm a student and I happen to be here and I, I think I can help make a change that's for the good. But the advantage that students have today that we didn't have um, 20 years ago is you don't have to wait for mainstream media to tell your story. You can do it yourself. You can document it, you can put it on a blog, you can shoot it, you can write about it, and you should. I wish 20 years ago that we were documenting our stories that way because now 20 years later, I might be using that footage for a different story or see what's, ha you know, what's, what's transpired in 20 years and so on. That's something that should be a part of the movement, any movement today. And somebody down here had her hand up for a while. Sorry. Hello, welcome to Canada, eh? Uh, my name Thank is you, uh, eh? JP Magic and we are all the way from Conestoga College. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And uh, what is your take with uh, uh, social media and uh, YouTube? Because YouTube, you got like the Young Turks and uh, Phil, right? And uh, they have like social media news. And what is your take on that? And again, thank you for great. your time. I think it's fabulous. Um, I, I think that there's something special about not having four or three, no, that's four, that's three, um, gatekeepers. I think that having an endless number of ways to consume news is fabulous. It should, it should, doesn't always, make us smarter. Um, it should make us more creative. It, we should be able to grow more as a result of it. The reason why I say it doesn't necessarily is um, often the people, if you read comments on the end of um, news posts. Pick any page on CNN.com and read the post. You'll see that the people who are actually sitting there writing comments and, and contributing to that dialogue are not necessarily the most informed people. And, and they're actually people who have an agenda. And they will go from one page to another and talk about liberal, blah, 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 or racist, blah, blah, blah. Or, and, and really, it's they're on a mission to do that. Um, so, Citizen journalism, I think, is what you're describing, is, is, is incredibly valuable. You don't have to be, if you can afford it, and find a way to do it that um, is possible, makes it possible, then why not? I think it's great. And, 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 and I'm not from that school of thought that it's somehow threatening to mainstream media. I think it makes us sharper and better because we have to be. Because it's now we've got competition, like real competition. I think it's great. You're using it yourself. You're using it sort of to, to expand the platform for in America with through social media and Twitter as well. So uh, I mean, I love the way ma mainstream media has actually sort of usurped some of the techniques of citizen journalism and just. I mean, it's impossible to watch CNN without I report, for example, right. is is part of of the culture. In fact, when we we did the um, Silicon Valley documentary, we had a screening. And it was a screening with an online um, news association, and it was deliberate. We filled the room with digital reporters, and at the beginning of the event, um, we asked all of the reporters to keep their phones on and to tweet or use Facebook or any site they wanted to and talk about what they were thinking as they watched. And that was deliberate, and what happened was that's what started the storm of um, reviews and, and conversations well before the film was even released on CNN. And I think that's part of the dialogue that's critical and, and really, really valuable. Hi, um, I'm Miran from Sheridan College. And I was wondering if being skeptical and like not really accepting of certain things leads to great journalism. Um, I, I think that you know, is it skepticism or is it curiosity? Um, one, they're both completely different words. One word implies that you just sort of doubt everything you hear. Um, you're cynical. The other means you just want to know more. I like to think of it as curiosity. Um, are journalists skeptical? They should be. There's a healthy it's healthy to have a good dose of skepticism in your journalism, but I think it's even more valuable to be curious and want to know more 
because the more you want to learn, learn and know as you produce each story, um, the richer your stories will be. Hi, I'm Ophelia from Ryerson University, and um, and my class. Yeah, <laughs> Ryerson journalism. But um, I just wanted to ask how you deal as a starting out journalist, kind of with rejection and not taking it personally. You know, um, especially when you're applying for internships. I think some of us, at least I have learned that when you're doing a streeter story and it's kind of spontaneous, you don't have time to be upset. But when it comes to applying for jobs, how do you get that motivation to keep pushing when you don't always get that answer? You take every rejection letter, you print it, you put it on your wall. And it doesn't matter if you get a wall filled with rejection, that's your motivation, because you know you're as good as you are and you just keep going. And I, I actually have friends who, who've done that. They would just take rejection letters and stick them on the wall and use that as their juice to keep going. If it's something you want, and that's true for any occupation, you have to um, not only be pr look for opportunities, but you have to be prepared when those opportunities come along. So that means sharpening your skills all the time. Hi, I'm Mikkel, and I'm from the Ryerson School of Journalism. And um, you were talking about how when you came back to Canada and you looked at the stories um, that they wrote pertaining to like the crimes happening with the black youth, um, and they're not talking in, they're not really um, going in depth about how were their lives or why did they turn out the way that they did. And if we as students, we want to get involved with that, how would we be able to do that and to do it in an effective manner for it to, um, for other people to have access to it and for it to have an impact on the way that um, major news companies write the news? I think there's a number of ways. One is to get inside the newsrooms. Like get internships. You should all be pursuing internships. There's something to learn um, in every newsroom. If you have an internship and you're inside a newsroom, um, a news agency, then immediately you have access and the ability to pitch stories. You can also pitch from the outside. Um, but then separately, you can, as this gentleman was asking about YouTube, you can be a citizen journal journalist. You can tell your own story, package it, and then send your story to newsrooms and say, I have in exclusively interviewed this person, or I have access to this, or, or if you're interested in using my footage, or however you want to um, market it, but you can also do that. As I said, with this documentary um, in Haiti, we used footage in it from someone who wasn't a journalist. He was there for religious reasons. But he, did, he didn't know he was a journalist, but he did a pretty good job, and we were able to use his footage. I have one more question. <clears throat> uh, hi, I'm Josh Kennedy. I'm from Conestoga. I was wondering, um, did you ever get emotional while doing these stories? Like, you know, some of the stories like Hurricane Katrina did, and all those people who lost their homes, did you ever get emotional about it? Yeah, of course. Um, I think the hardest story I ever told was about um, a little girl named Heaven. And it was a story where I was um, um, on call with an association called the National Association of Missing and Exploited Children. And, um, and they would call me whenever a child went missing. And, and at that point, I was working at Dateline, and I was supposed to put together, uh, my assignment was to put together a documentary about a missing child. And, and start the story from the second they go missing till they're found. Um, this was a story of a little girl in Alabama and um, her full name was Heaven Lachey Ross. And Heaven went missing and I arrived the day she was there, and oh, sorry, the day she went missing, um, on her way to school with her older sister. And um, they lived in a trailer park and the trailer park was um, created with two rows of trailers with a road down the middle and her sister was walking ahead of her. She got to the bus stop and doesn't know when Heaven wandered off. She just remembers they were both lost in their thoughts I suppose. The older sister arrives at the bus stop and the bus arrives and she realizes her little sister's not with her and she gets on the bus and goes to school. Hours later the school calls the parents and say Heaven didn't arrive at school today. And, and then her missing investigation begins. It was 
heartbreaking to do that story. Um, not only did they never find that child, it was just, it was so difficult to be there and witness the pain and anguish of the parents in the community and not know what was gonna happen to this child. And, um, and to make a long story short, years and years later, they did find this little girl. Um, and, and it was a dog who found a backpack and pulled it out and out from under this crawl space under a porch came a backpack with a bone attached. And, and it was years later and she, she was murdered. And the, that case was never ever solved. Um, and, and it actually never aired as a documentary because it was, it was just, it was too sad to watch. It did air as a, um, like a six or eight minute piece and, and, and we used it as an opportunity to ask viewers if you have any information to call the local police and so on. And it, it didn't, with the idea that eventually we could go in and update it and include all that information, but it, it never led anywhere. I mean, there are stories that that um, are painful to follow and, and live with you forever. I never met heaven, um, but I feel like I did. How did you feel about the decision not to air that document? Oh, I was heartbroken. Um, I, I, was, I was pleased that we were still doing it and that we were making a, a, a call for help. Um, but I wanted to tell her story and all the the beauty of who she was and the complexity of her circumstances. Um, what made her story particularly um, tragic was um, she was she was white um, and and her parents were um, her mom was white but her stepdad was black black so a lot of attention by the police went to her dad as a suspect. Um, they were both also um, habitual drug users. And um, not, I don't think they had, um, they were sellers if I remember correctly, they were users. So they had that layer of um, tragedy connected to their story. And they were addicts, they, they had issues, but they, neither of them were responsible for um, murdering heaven. Um, in the end, it was a stranger abduction. And, um, and, and and it was just very, very sad. And by the time the police realized that, and FBI, you know, these stories you have to, um, within, they say if you don't find a missing child who's abducted by a stranger within 24 hours, each hour after that 24 hour period, the success, the chance of success diminishes. Um, so within a week after we, we knew that it became less and less likely that they'd find her, but it took them about three days to change directions of their, their search. Tough business we're in, I think. It's hard. And rewarding. In many ways, I agree. Any more questions, guys? Any questions? Okay. Is there a, in the back there? Wait for me? Okay. Uh, hey, uh, I'm Sarah. I'm... Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, Sarah. Sorry. Uh, U of T grad, actually, and Centennial College grad in journalism. Um, just wanted to go back to kind of you're talking about like diversity and how important it is to tell these stories. And you had said about, you know, pitching these in a certain way to make sure they're told. How would you say someone, you know, coming from the outside who obviously don't have that clout, like I'm not, you know, the executive producer of CNN, to be able to say this is important, listen to this story, to like approach somebody from the outside and get them to tell these stories when you think it's important? Yeah, pitches are really important. In your pitch, it has to be succinct, it's not an essay. I don't, I don't have time to read several pages. I wanna know in that first line, in that nugget line, what's the story? Then I wanna know immediately how you're gonna tell that story in a paragraph. I don't need to know all the nuances at the beginning. You have to hook me that quickly. So what's the story? Why should we do the story? What's important about it? I get pitches that say, um, your, black, your next Black in America series should be about blacks and obesity. Okay, what's the story? Um, that's an issue. A an issue isn't a story. You have to figure out exactly what piece of the story you're pitching. And this, this is true for all platforms. You can't tell everything in a, a single documentary or a single newsprint report. You, you need to be focused and know exactly what the story is you're writing. And as you're, 
write your pitch and as you're crafting your story, you need to rem keep remembering that everything needs to come back to the center, to what the spine of your story is. It has to all connect. Um, my fascination always with the news kind of has been what you mentioned in the beginning is it seems like everywhere you read the news, there's so much news in one city, but we only see the negatives. Do you think this is something that has is just in the human kind of condition because we have such a brutal kind of human history or do you think it's within the last few decades movies and stuff have become more brutal? Why do you think we kind of have this thirst for negative news? I can't speak for everybody of course when I say this but it's almost like like you said the news are always negative. Why? Why do you think that is? Um, that's a good question. Um, Last night we had a, a screening um, similar to this in a discussion and somebody asked from the audience um, why is entertainment so negative? Um, you know, wh why do reality shows where people are having cat fights and um, at the most difficult stages of their life um, and, and having these really disgusting conversations and, and, and offensive situations. Why are they getting um, all the attention? And the question isn't, why do they get attention? It's, why do people watch? Because we, we vote with our remotes. You, you vote when you buy a subscription to a magazine. You vote when, you know, if you're watching that and, and millions of people watch that kind of entertainment, you'll keep getting it. Um, so I, I think it's a much deeper question because it's not just news or entertainment. It, it's, it, I think it's, it's, it's more complicated. It's what, why do we, why, if, if people didn't pay attention to those kind of news stories, there probably would be fewer of them. Um, but the truth is when there is a crisis, you do, going back to the news now, when there's a crisis, whether it's um, the shooting in Newton, Connecticut, or um, Katrina, you want to know immediately everything that's going on, and and you want to know what people are experiencing, and 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 we are fascinated um, and connected. You can't watch that story about Sandy Hook and not be heartbroken, uh, heartbroken about the loss of lives, those children. Um, I, I, part of it's human nature, but some of it, um, absolutely, we do probably, we could do a better job of, of putting on more inspiring um, and uplifting stories. And I, I know for my part, I, I try to. I think we have time for one more question, so. Uh. Uh, do you ever find yourself in a situation where you look into a story and find that the uh, subject matter or uh, it's just too sensitive? Or do you think that every story has the right to be told? Too sensitive, like what? Um, just it'll like where you said with the story about that little girl heaven, how they didn't want to play it because it bring it was just so sad. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, find that a lot with stories, or do you think that every story just has to be told differently if it it's about how you present it instead of just not telling it all together? Well, I, I think those two questions are kind of related. I mean, in the case of heaven, it w the decision wasn't not to put it on a, at all. The decision was to put it on in a way that was responsible so we could perhaps generate some answers um, um, that would help the investigation. I, I don't know what too sensitive of, now I'm sounding like I'm a, an American. Um, I don't know what too sensitive is. Um, I, I think that there, if, if you mean um, crossing the line and um, privacy lines, that's a problem. Um, but I don't know what too sensitive is. I didn't mean so much about privacy, just about the actual topic itself. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think that there's taste, um, and, and that's absolutely um, a, a place where I will draw the line. Um, I don't want to offend or be offended. Um, in, and and I, again, I work for CNN. If I worked for MTV or somebody else, I might feel differently and booty shaking might be okay. Um, I'm not gonna do a documentary that looks like it belongs on, you know, 
whomever. <laughs> but, trying not to single out any I, network. I, I, maybe just a final question then. Just, uh, you said you've been in journalism for 20 years. I just wanted to know how you see censorship. Is it getting worse over the years in terms of availability of news stories, or is there always this glass ceiling with censorship? Keeping in some just kind of like the idea of over the last 20 years, news stories, do you think they're getting censored more? Yeah, you know what's interesting less? about um, uh, that question is, um, so I work for a 24-hour news agency, and it used to be when a story broke, everybody would just automatically turn on CNN. Oh my God, somebody was shot, CNN. Oh my God, there's a new prime minister, CNN. Like you just would go to CNN. Now something happens, Michael Jackson's dead. That story was broken on Twitter, right? Um, we still break stories, but more and more frequently, um, stories are broken by blogs, by websites, by tweets on Facebook, and so on. I think that what's changing in the industry isn't so much censorship, but more that the people, again, gatekeepers, are, are not, it's not a, a, a small, limited pool of people, it, it's almost anybody. There are fewer gatekeepers. Uh, however, having said that, I still think that it's up to us um, in the mainstream media to make sure that we um, have standards um, and practices that we maintain. And, and that means making sure that there's balance and fairness and um, accuracy in everything we report. Um, and, and that's what I think makes the difference between a mainstream news outlet and just any random reporter. We, we have an obligation to, to maintain those, those rules. If you're blogging for yourself, you know, it's, a lot of people feel like, sue me. Like, you don't like it? Don't look. We can't, we can't do that. It still has to um, be accurate, fair, and, and um, It's balanced. a lot to verify something and to get, you know, to, to sort of source it properly and to make sure it's actually happened. And yeah, we have to be responsible in our responsible, reporting. Yeah. All right, well, I think that wraps up things for uh, this afternoon. Jolene, thank you so much for making uh, your story, uh, sharing your story with us and the stories of the many people in, in your documentaries. Can I say one thank you? Sure. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to TIFF for um, allowing me to have this conversation with you. And a special thank you to Julie Crooks with BAND, because without Julie's um, invitation, I wouldn't be here. So thank you very much. And I don't know if there are other BAND or TIFF members in the audience, but thank you all so much for this opportunity. Thank you to Keith for, for inviting me to host this. Thank, thank you, Keith. <laughs> and, um, and keep coming to the higher learning sessions. They're great. And good thank luck to all of you. It's great to be among yeah future journalists or current journalists, My depending guys, on how you guys, go. Guys, you go back to class and we're doing an obituary assignment today. <laughs> I just killed Barbara Streisand and Christopher Plummer for them today, so they can write their obituary, one oh, of them, wow. they have to choose one.